having flown through James, we might want to ask, what does James have to say? How do we sum this up theologically, and what is he adding to the canon? Well, the first thing is he talks about God, God the Father uh, and Jesus the Lord. Well, God is the creator, he says, the father of lights. And often we forget about that. We forget about his creation or it becomes a simply a doctrine. They don't realize that all good theology is rooted in God as creator. James, uh, God then sends good to those who ask. He doesn't send evil. You see, God doesn't change like his creatures. He only sends good. And he says, well, the, the lights of heaven, they change. The moon changes. The stars seem to change, seem to move around. No, God never changed. It's good, 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 good. Therefore, God does not send tests, but rather gives us birth to life, fascinating language that he uses there because the word for giving birth was previous used for a uh, feminine subject, uh, giving birth to death um, b earlier, but and is only used for females. So it's a fascinating um, use of, uh, we could say, of feminine in imagery for God and James is not afraid to do this. God, though, will not be two-timed. He requires our soul allegiance. One of the translation problems in James is in chapter 4, it often says, you know, adulterous people or adulterers or something like that. And uh, the word in Greek is adulteresses. It is feminine and it is there on purpose to tell you that God's people uh, are being like Israel in the Old Testament, untrue to him. You know, he won't be, you cannot trust the world and God. It's with me, it's, you know, me alone. It's not all, it's all or nothing with me. It, is it all or nothing with you, says God. Uh, Jesus then is the exalted Lord whose Torah is the royal law. Um, Jesus will judge when he comes. Uh, in fact, he is now at the door. There is a final phrase there. There is one lawgiver and judge, and that is ambiguous. Is it God who is the lawgiver and judge, or is it Jesus who is the lawgiver of, and judge, or are they so merged in James's mind with Jesus as representing the Father that um, James himself has not made the distinction? Uh, whatever the case, God, the Father, and Jesus are the source of all authority. Well, that was the good news. God will set things right, and God... Uh, is the creator who creates life in us. The bad news is about human beings. Uh, we need to resist trials uh, where faithfulness conflicts with desire. I want to do this, or by compromising my morals here, or the teaching of Jesus here, I can do something that feels good or I won't get persecuted. Resisting those things, resisting trials, results in eschatological anticipated joy. Not joy, you know, happy, 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 but joy in knowing that the good is coming with the return of Jesus. Now, the root of our divided loyalty that we have to resist something is that desire, our drives, or um, uh, to move into another field in which I teach uh, uh, Bowen theory or 
family systems theory, our limbic system, our emotional system. We blame God for the frustration of our desires. Well, if you hadn't created me this way, I wouldn't be struggling with this. You know, that sort of thing. No, no, no. Uh, uh, that is just our desires that have become uncontrolled. Following desire leads first to sin and sin to death, or following desire leads to the divided mind that's trying to secure our, our future uh, with something other than God, or a divided heart um, is another way of putting it. That's the way it would be put in the Old, uh, Old Testament. And it's one part of being adulterous Israel. Now, the good news is that God has birthed us by the word and given us his wisdom. And that enables us to live under the lordship of Jesus, the anointed one. Thus, you need patient endurance or wisdom or what we could call repentant submission. That would be James chapter 4 to live this out. Now, James has no problem talking about the law, but it is probably the law as interpreted by Jesus. There is a lot in James that seems to draw from the Sermon on the Mount tradition. Uh, there is none of Paul's tension with the law, which for Paul means becoming an ethnic Jew. For James, he doesn't have a problem with people telling his people to become ethnic Jews. Uh, some of them would have been, but uh, for whatever reason, that is not the tension in his churches. He doesn't have a problem talking about following the teaching of Jesus. The community gathers then probably for a common meal in a synagogue, a gathering. That's just the Greek word for a gathering that became used for a Jewish gathering. We find that in James 2 2. It is led by elders or presbyters, as James 5 14 says. And the whole letter contributes to communal solidarity. Now, Jesus is the exalted Lord and yet also the judge at the door, so final judgment is soon. But don't think of judgment as something negative. When a ruler came to judge in the first century, they would sit in the town square and what they did was they would say, um, uh, you know, bring the people before me and, uh, you know, uh, one person, we'll call him Claudius. Claudius, I hear you have done these great things for the town. Yes, the people didn't always appreciate you, but uh, I have heard about it. I'm going to give you this honorable status or this laurel reef or this uh, particular position in my government, and so on. Um, he rewards those who have been loyal, and of course he also rewards in a negative way those who have been disloyal to him. So judgment is a positive as well as a negative thing. We want to stand in the final judgment because we want the reward that is coming. Now, James also talks about um, uh, not just suffering, uh, but also speech and money. Jesus is ruler and judge, as we said, and suffering is then a test of our commitment where we struggle with our desires, but where we uh, show Jesus that we really are committed with him. Commitment is then to be single-minded or it is worthless, says James. And I use commitment rather than faith because for us, the word faith uh, often means something that we're thinking about. You know, I believe this to be true. 
Whereas when it has a personal object like God or Jesus, the, the Greek word uh, indicates commitment to that person, or I sometimes talk about allegiance to that person. And you either have commitment to that person or it is worthless. It's sort of like my talking about my wife. Um, I am committed to her. Uh, or it is worthless. <laughs> she would not be impressed if I said, uh, I'm a very energetic man, and I have time for you, and I have time for Susie. That does not go down. Um, neither does it go down with God. So single-mindedness of our commitment is seen by the control of our speech and by the use of our money, particularly its use in charity. Commitment to Jesus, then, is obedience. Jesus is exalted Lord. He's even now standing at the door about the judge. And the true test of obedience to or faith in Jesus is obedience to him. And this obedience looks very much like, as I said, the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount.